everybody, I'm Zenith Warrior Princess, the cutest of buns, and welcome back to Diving into DuckTales, where my co-hosts usually react to DuckTales, and occasionally I'm around to actually talk about my opinions on the episodes. But before we begin, uh, how's it going? We have my co-hosts, uh, first of all, Y2 Staller. Uh, it's going pretty good, man. This uh, this batch of episodes has been has been really interesting, to say the least. But we'll get to that. Mhm. Mm and we also have Doug MacBerry. How's it going, Doug? Oh, going okay. Uh, feels like forever since we've done this, but yet it's only been like a few months. But then again, 2020 was such a long decade. <laughs> 2020 was the decadiest of decades. It's uh, let, let it let it let's go past this part. In in fact, let never play this again. Um, <laughs> but I want and, to play uh, DuckTales again. <laughs> <laughs> and also we have Cat McBerry. How's it going, Cat? They canceled DuckTales. <laughs> uh yeah, they canceled DuckTales. Uh, I, I actually heard about it, like, at the last second because of Cat, and I'm not really appearing on camera as much anymore. I like to basically uh, try to keep off camera as much as possible, so we did that little gag bit, but now I'm here to talk on my thoughts on the season overall, uh, the, this batch of episodes, uh, the cancellation of DuckTales... All of our questions so far, there's a lot to discuss. We're going to try to keep it uh, to a reasonable time. But, uh, yeah. Um, is there anything uh, you guys want to get into before I start talking about my thoughts on this batch of episodes? Well, I did want to say on my end that uh, since we're kind of combining this as both a podcast and a q and A, I I do have a list of questions, both in relation to the episodes, as well as going forward, what, you know, what we want to know and what we, what, what we hope to expect from the show from here on out. I also have a bunch of uh, comments that I want to share that were uh, posted on our videos, you know, give some of our, give, give some of our faithful viewers a, a moment to shine and to answer their questions since I couldn't at the time. So forgive me if I stop every now and again just to bring up something that somebody wanted to ask us about. Alrighty, and with that, uh, with that stated, with that out of the way, let's get started on this batch of episodes. Honestly, this season has been really, really good so far, and this batch of episodes in particular was really good. There's only a couple episodes that I felt were weaker, not as bad as some of like season two and season one, um, but just not like to the same level as what I usually come to expect from this season. But uh, we started off with a really great note with the Phantom and the Sorceress, which is about the Phantom Blot. We finally get backstory for the Phantom Blot. Um, we follow up with Magicka Dispel, and Lena becomes a white mage. Um, this episode was really, really good. She goes Super uh, Saiyan! I, <laughs> Super Saiyan! She achieved her final form. <laughs> and they used um, a montage! Montage! And for um, some reason, Gladstone's in it. <laughs> for some reason, Gladstone is in it. I, I didn't think that I would like his addition to the episode. Since the first half of the episode, I didn't really get where it was going. But it really added a nice layer. It is really nice karma seeing Gladstone finally have... No luck whatsoever, um, <laughs> but I think the the coolest part was Machika getting getting pretty much crapped on the entire episode. Yeah, getting her magic back, but Lita is just sticking it to her the entire episode and beats her and the Phantom Blot and becomes White Mage. You don't underestimate the White Mage. Well, one thing I will say about Gladstone, and I mean, I've already kind of beat this dead horse uh during our uh you know live react 
but uh, what you call it, uh, Gladstone losing his luck was a uh, plot point of uh, an episode back in the original uh, DuckTales, so it is a nice callback uh, to that. Mm. I do like how they tie in Gladstone, like where, like why is he always lucky as like some as a source of magic, which makes sense when you think about it and the way they presented it throughout in the series thus far and with him losing it it's like oh he you know it's it's a it's a it's a form of magic that's why he's always always had all this luck so i'm like so when they explained that very early on in the episode i was like okay that makes sense so i liked how they were able to that extra layer that you were talking about zen like that's where it kind of leads into that well, actually, um, I had at least two people comment on the video explaining that. Um, I'll read this one comment here from, uh, I don't I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Joe Cabid Rivera. Um, he said that Gladstone's luck is explained in the comics. Before Gladstone was born, a painter painted a good luck hex on the front of the barn and a bad luck hex behind the barn. I believe Gladstone grew up in a farm and the painter explained that it's a gift for the baby. He'll face good luck in his life in you know good in front of the barn and leave all the bad luck behind him behind the barn the hex is a form of magic which would explain why gladstone lost it hmm okay and kind of explains donald too um interesting <laughs> it was that's very interesting <laughs> um i also really really love the the comedy in this episode gladstone just like uh, no one ever like a random twenty dollar bill just never uh, popped into my hand. Did you know that stores close? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's it's really funny. It's good karma. Um, but I I like the stuff with Lena the most. I think her being the white mage at the end was really really good. I was interested with Phantom Blot honestly. Mm-hmm. Cause like. Because we never really saw Phantom Blot, you know, really fleshed out before. And not only did they, like, bring him into, like, the main group of villains, but they actually gave him a sympathetic backstory. Like, I wasn't expecting that. Because when, cause when, we're, cause when we're watching, like, hit him, you know, take on Magicka and she explains what she did to him, like, okay. Uh, so wh here, here, how about we do this? How about the girls just leave, let Phantom Blot, you know, just do his thing with Magica, and there you go. Because <laughs> like I, I am actually starting to feel like Phantom Blot might become a good guy, because he has he's pretty sympathetic, and we'll get more into this later. But I like what they did with Phantom Blot. Yeah, I did too. And actually, was it someone responded in regards to a comment I made? Because at the time, I was curious because, you know, they show that Phantom Blot was secretly the Funzo mascot, and I thought that this was what that that was the case the whole time, which was weird considering Magico worked for Funzo. But according to uh, Nick the Dreamer. Uh, there was a deleted scene where it was going to show that the Phantom Blot became the Funzo's mascot after the events of Glom Tales in order to keep tabs on Magica while secretly working on his gauntlet. The scene itself doesn't have footage, but we have Frank Agones to confirm it. So ah. that makes a lot more sense to me because I'm like, wait a minute, he's been the mascot this whole time. He could have killed Magica anytime he wanted and he waited till now. Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, at the same time, she lost all her magic, so what threat does she pose? Like, he's he, he wants revenge, yes, but he's also against magic specifically, and she didn't have them. That would have made her an easier target, plus she killed his family. Like, that does not... Her being depowered doesn't automatically mean he's not going to, like, go after her. I don't take him for the sporting type. <laughs> mm, we'll get into that in a little bit. I, I have a counter for that, but I'll save it. Um, anything else before we move on? I do like how we turned it to Donald for a brief bit. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> the, the most cursed thing ever. Um, also, we saw the goat again. I am so curious oh. about what that dimension is like. <laughs> I get the feeling we're never going to see what that dimension is like. <laughs> Welcome just... to the dimension of goats. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm just gonna say, 
the next episode, they put a moon lander on Earth. I don't really have much to say about it. It's a decent episode, but I think it's one of the weaker ones because it's it's there to really advance Penumbra. Um, there's some really great stuff with Glomgold. I love, <laughs> love, love what they did with Glomgold and having one of the moon uh, the Moonanites be his new assistant and how well they work off of each other. And the Glom wheel, uh, the curse you flint, uh, me wheel, me wheel. <laughs> like, <laughs> like there's some really great moments with Glomgold and really good moments with Penumbra and her character development. But I could take or leave this episode simply because it's it, it doesn't really advance too too much. I don't know. What do, what do you think, Doug? Uh, I mean, definitely this is a good one for, you know, finding out, you know, since the uh, Moonvasion, uh, how the Moonlanders or Moonanites, as uh, we love to call them, uh, which how they've been adjusting to life on Earth. Um, it, yeah, it is interesting to see uh, Penumbra. Uh, apparently, we learn that, um, which call it, there's there's the whole relationship between um, Launchpad and uh, Penumbra that is apparently doomed from the start because she's not into his type, if mm. you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> So that's already interesting enough. But the thing that th this episode, more than uh, Glomgold, more than the Moonlanders, more than anything, the freaking ducks. <laughs> yes, the can we talk about the ducks, ducks for a bit? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I mean, the can of worms that opens up, and <laughs> just how, like, nobody is acknowledging it except Penumbra. <laughs> and the internet well, for that matter <laughs> well if you think about it this is set after a nuclear apocalypse where there's actual ducks that didn't get radiation and then the ducks that evolved from humans I guess where's your logic for that <laughs> so is it like uh, from Bojack Horseman is it like sort of a chicken for days uh, scenario that's what I was thinking which... Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking that too. <laughs> there's like a there's like it's the same sort of duck species, but they were like they were kept in like crates and stuff, and basically became nothing more than mindless animals for like raised for slaughter. <laughs> just the expression yeah. on Penumbra's face, just like wait, what? <laughs> that was my reaction. Too. I mean, I know honestly, were... <laughs> I didn't even notice. I don't really think about these sorts of things. But that's just me. Um, I will say that this is a good episode for Penumbra, getting to see Penumbra grow and evolve and finally realize the value of Earth. And the stuff with Launchpad was great. The stuff with Glom Gold was amazing. Why didn't we get the Glom Coaster, though? I'm upset. <laughs> I wanted the sharks. Speaking of... The sharks. I wouldn't cover it. Speaking <laughs> of, I, I also... It, it, it... It's one of those things that I keep forgetting, but Dewey's uh, little side plot about, you know, him having to, you know, him wanting to be caught on uh, one of Glomgold's rides when it breaks down. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps getting upstaged by some some other duck. Timmy that Jenkins. was really good, too. <laughs> I will um... not be Timmy Jenkins out of this again. <laughs> <laughs> and yet he did, even though he was trapped on the ride. <laughs> Um, I, I will it, say it's a I comedic will... episode. Uh... Yeah, definitely a fun episode. Um, I just real quick, I just wanted to say, like, I know you didn't notice the whole thing with the ducks. I didn't notice the whole thing with Penny, to be honest. Like that kind of went over my head at first, just the way she kind of worded it. Because I had someone in the comments, like, "Giant robots conquer the world," was saying, like, "I can't believe you skipped over Penny's coming out." And I'm like, what? <laughs> Cause like when I, she said like I she said like I'm too. not into Earth, she's like I'm not into Earth males. I thought she wasn't into Earthlings, but it's like oh no, she's actually a lesbian. Canonically, she is. Mm. So oh I oh my god I am a bad I'm a dra I'm a bad lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize that. Well, th that's the thing though. They worded it so specifically, like it does feel like. 
I know I they shouldn't have to call attention to it, but it, no, it's, it's the whole queer baiting thing. It's like with with I, kid I, shows. I feel like Violet's dad's w- situation was easier. Like it was better, you know. Yeah, well, you that that was a little was more blatant. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I I didn't notice any of that stuff with Penny. Um, Glomgold was the best part of the episode for me. Uh, and I'm not saying this is a bad episode. I think it's weaker than some of the others that we're going to be talking about, simply because it was mainly focused on comedy, and it's really funny, but there's not as much to talk about. I would have thought you'd been happy to see more of uh, Zenith. You know, she had more of a speaking role. <laughs> we had more of me, but that that's besides the... I mean... But, by the way, someone pointed out something interesting to me. Um, was it Mike the Chicago Critic mentioned that her voice actress is uh, April Winchell? So, you know, the same voice actress for Black Heron. The same one as Cruella DeVille and Peg from Groove Troop and Miss <laughs> Finster from Re- Recess. <laughs> Office supplies. Office supplies for everyone. <laughs> Office supplies for everyone. Oh, <laughs> uh, God. We have stuff to talk about with Black Heron because I've actually come around on that. But uh, first we'll of all, <laughs> um, b- before we get to that, I do want to talk about the next episode. Unless someone else, uh, someone has something else to say. I'm good. <laughs> All right. So the next episode, I really liked. And I know people have differing opinions on this, but uh, this is called The Trickening. It was the Halloween episode. And this is one of my favorite episodes of the season. <laughs> and I know it has these problems with the structure. But I think a lot of it is, I love Halloween. Halloween is my holiday. And when I approach Halloween, I don't approach it as horror. Like, I don't I don't need things to be horrifying. I approach it more in the Halloween Town spirit um, or the Costume Quest spirit, if you've ever played that game. Um, I love trick-or-treating. I love the fun aspect of Halloween. And this spoke to me on a lot of levels. Um, I love that they have this haunted house that supposedly has all this candy when it turns out to be monsters in monster costumes. And that was an interesting twist for me because (laughs) the original monsters uh, are there. They're the old school like Frankenstein, Nosferatu, but they're not scary anymore to some people. So they have to dress up as clowns and and other such stuff. And I thought that was funny uh, and clever. Whereas with the B-plot, we have Launchpad (laughs) believing that Halloween is real, where we have yet another Evil Dead parody. I loved it. (laughs) I loved it. Um, But I know you guys have thoughts. Uh, uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Eric. What do you think? Um, I liked how... You know, it's funny because we, in all, throughout the entire series, like, they've done, like, Halloween, air quote, episodes before, but not, like, something that's focused entirely on, like, the whole trick-or-treating, you know, dressed up in costume aspect of Halloween. So, it, I'm surprised it took them this long to get to, like, this point to do a, I guess, an official Halloween episode. And... I mean, I'm kind of mixed on it because, like, I do like the B plot with Launchpad and how ridiculous and how far he goes. I think although there are parts of it where he goes a little bit too far, but like, but like the A plot. I mean, the A plot is interesting. Is the A plot's only good when they get to like some of like the creepy stuff when they do like the the horror stuff, like the creepy stuff when they go inside the house and there's and all and uh, and Huey, Dewey, and Louie and gang are all scared and stuff but i feel but overall it's kind of i mean overall like like plot wise like it's there's some stuff that i could that could have been better but there is the one part with when the the plot lines start to converge and 
he's and that Launchpad sees the monsters and he tries to war them off by by reading a spell, which is basically a list of ingredients <laughs> on the candy <laughs> wrapper to try and <laughs> try and cast them away. And... Monosodium glycoclade, artificial mm-hmm. flavoring. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that I thought that was brilliant, and it tied everything uh, up, tied everything together. But like, it, it, for me, it was a mixed it was a mixed bag of goodies, pun intended. <laughs> um, yeah, I I could like, I watched all your reaction videos after I watched the episode, so I could form my own opinion, and then see what you guys thought and. I enjoyed the episode, but when I saw your reactions, I'm like, yeah, the pacing's off. Um, Launchpad is really dumb in this episode to a to a more than usual degree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, like the plot lines converge in a very weird way. But I like each of the plots individually, and you know. There are some really great moments, especially when the monsters are like, you guys are messed up. You're scared of clowns and dolls. Like, what is what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> I do admit I like that part. Like, <laughs> and the whole idea of, like, wanting to get the most candy and and stuff like that. Like, there, there are parts to me that bring to mind, um, and I'm bringing this up again, Costume Quest. It's a game made by Tim Schafer, uh, Studio Double Fine, and basically kids start trick-or-treating, but monsters kidnap uh, their brother, and they have to go and save them by trick-or-treating and fighting monsters. (laughs) It has that same energy, and I love the A plot. The B plot, I definitely can see this, this Evil Dead vibe, but it doesn't quite gel with the A plot, and... There's some things that I I think are a little bit. I I don't think Della should have encouraged Launchpad to be no. honest in, at all. Well, um, what was it? Someone <laughs> in the comments pointed out something. I was a Shakespeare addict. Uh, asked, you'd think uh, Della would have wanted to trick or treat with a boy, seeing it was her first Halloween with them. And I gotta right. agree. <laughs> right <laughs> i mean so, i mean there was someone responded that like well to be fair the you know she hadn't spent time with her brother in a while either but i'm like yeah why wouldn't she want to go with her kids like i know they're getting a little older they can trick-or-treat on their own but you think she'd want to you know considering how she co- tried to combine all the holidays when she first arrived and everything she this would be like the first legit holiday she spent with him but no she spends it wanting to terrify other kids and you know further traumatizing this poor man who thinks that halloween is real <laughs> that, yeah <you> know... <laughs> but but the angel devil costumes were a nice touch i did yeah. like that um <laughs> so yeah i i do i do see where we're getting at with with it's a mixed bag. There are parts I really do like and the parts I don't like, but I, I honestly, I feel like the parts that I do like override some of the stuff that I don't. And uh, I like the ending where, where he finally learns what Halloween really means. I, I just, I happy I, Halloween. Oh God. <laughs> Just, don't get me wrong, I watched this numerous times since the reaction video, and I don't, like, dislike it as much as when I first saw it, but I still don't like it. And just, because they have to, like, reach so far to make certain things happen. It's like, you gotta make Launchpad even dumber than he is, like, you know, in order for him to fully believe the whole thing about Halloween. It's like, doesn't he watch television? Doesn't he see, like, Halloween decorations up? Doesn't he see, like, costumes, stores? You mean to tell me he doesn't notice any of that stuff leading up to Halloween? And on top of that, they have the monsters, you know, who are, you know, luring kids in and scaring them for candy. And it's like, oh, well, the candy stores aren't open at night. And I'm like, so why don't you just go trick-or-treating as yourselves and get candy that way? Why do you have to do this whole convoluted thing of luring kids in and stealing their candy? And then, of course, Louie's yeah. like... <laughs> and then Louie, yeah, of course, is like, oh, we, we can go uh, to this mansion and get decades worth of candy. Why would you want decades old candy? That shit's got to taste nasty. Just <laughs> like, like I said, they it have a have stretch a lot of for holes. so much for everything, and that's what just annoys me about the whole thing. <laughs> 
it's good in the moment. I if guess. you think about it, it's bad. But <laughs> I don't know. It, it has this spirit to it that I like. Um, do you have anything to add, Doug? I mean, I don't really have much to add. I mean, honestly, I'd say this is probably the weakest uh, DuckTales episode in general. As a uh, Halloween episode, it's just okay. Um, it did premiere on my birthday, so I give it a little credit. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's enjoyable. But, yeah, like, like Kat and uh, Eric were saying, it's like, yeah, it, it's just kind of a very weak uh, plot, very weak, you know, just weak in general. Um, but one thing I do have to admit, it's one, it, it's it's kind of for this uh, Forbidden Fountain and the Forever Glades, uh, Let's Get Dangerous, and the uh, Escape from the Impossible Bin. Uh, one thing I liked, um, and, and kind of what what. Eric was saying about how they've had Halloween quote unquote episodes or, you know, scary ish episodes that they've been promoting. I mean, I think the last season they were promoting uh, Depths of Cousin Feathery uh, for their Halloween episode, which, I mean, I guess it kind of works. But in this case, uh, when uh, Disney uh, Channel was um, promoting, they were not just promoting. Uh, the um, the trickening. They were promoting every single episode that was happening in October and showing like all the you know really sort of scary moments from each one of those. And I thought that was a brilliant uh, promotional uh, you know campaign they had going there. Mm. I I obviously I don't have cable, so I I watch this stuff after the fact. Um, but that that actually really sounds like a good promotion. And now that I think about it, like a lot of the stuff in these episodes really fit for October. Uh, anyone else have anything else to add? I do like they got four like horror legends to voice the uh, vo the monsters. <laughs> yeah, that, that that was really cool. Like, honestly, I like the A plot a lot, even though it has holes. And it really feels like they were trying to tribute to the classics. You, you know what it feels like? Actually, the perfect analogy. I don't know if you've ever been to Count Orlock's Gallery of Horror. Um, in Salem, Massachusetts, every year they run this Gallery of Horror showcasing like the haunted house where a bunch of the old school horror movies are celebrated. It really reminds me a lot of that, and I think that's part of why I like it. Um, all right, uh, the next one that we're going to be talking about, the Forbidden Fountain of the Forever Glades, I think is the other weaker episode of the season. Um, I had seen a lot of this episode coming, and I don't think it's a bad episode, but I think this is a treasure that should have stayed buried. Uh, because they're trying to find the the, the Fountain of Youth, which, much like the original legend, and if you've seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, it steals youth instead of giving youth. And I'm like, why would you want this treasure? And uh, there, there, there are some plot holes that w were pointed out, like Ponce de Leon was obvious from the get-go, but... How does he have a resort if, you know, how, how has he been doing this all along with the internet and people leaving reviews and not getting caught? Um, it, it would have made more sense if it was a very remote location and only a few people over time, maybe. But, uh, I mean, there are things that I do like. I like that it showed Goldie and Scrooge kind of reliving their youth and a change for Goldie somewhat. Uh, there, there's some really good ideas in it. Um, I just feel like a lot of it is, uh, the, the, the stuff with the Fountain of Youth wasn't very engaging. Rocker Duck is not a good villain. Um, and then he, they get rid of Jeeves for the rest of the season. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Yeah, this is another one that I've watched, rewatched several times before, and I just, I, like, it's, again, I don't dislike it as much as before, but there are still things that, like, rub me the wrong way about it, particularly how, you know, the how the hell Ponce de Leon was able to run his friggin' resort for years with nobody noticing that he was doing this. It just, that baffles me. There were funny parts to the episode. There were little bits I liked, and... Webby getting, uh, get, having a really bad day and becoming the old nag was funny. Um, but there's just as many stuff that landed. There was stuff that didn't land. Again, I've never liked Rock or Duck. I don't think he's a good villain. And as this season goes on, he proves that he is not a good villain. Um, the only thing he's really good for is comic relief. And Jeeves was menacing, but because he soaked with the Fountain of Youth in this episode, which doesn't make sense because he's a, he's a Frankenstein monster, yes, but he's he shouldn't have been able to go to to a kid. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, now he's out for the rest of the season, and later on, Rocker Duck is just Rocker Duck being Rocker Duck. Um, anyone have anything to add to that? I feel like Rocker Duck, like, they were trying to do, like, two villains in this episode, and there's even a, a point in the episode where you kind of forget that Ponce de Leon was the actual villain of the episode, like, even so much so that in, in like, the third act where Rocker Duck then shows up at the hotel and, like, they're fighting, and then all of a sudden uh, when Jeeves becomes a baby and then Rocker Duck has to pick him up and then leaves, like, all of a sudden it's like, Oh wait, Ponce de Leon is still here, and then they have to keep fight, and they go back to fighting him. Like, like you, you forget for a moment that Ponce de Leon was supposed to be the main villain of the episode, but then Rocker Duck comes in and interferes. It's like there was no reason really to have Rocker Duck in the episode per se. Like, I get it. Like, he shows up, and then yeah, he shows, he comes back, but he's there on his own terms. Like, he he does come back in a later episode, and we'll get to that. But like having him here just kind of felt tacked on like there was no like they just threw him in because they needed to reintroduce him even though they could have reintroduced him later yeah and also old rocker duck is creepy <laughs> yeah he's all he's so of... soft <laughs> <laughs> soft i i do it think just... it's funny where he he's being used to pummel people but that's it. Yeah, I just, I don't, like, I feel like they should have kept him as, you know, a cameo at the very end. Like, you see him, you see Jeeves, like, subtly stealing, like, one of, like, the jugs, like, of the uh, youth water to revitalize him, thus explaining how he comes back later, looking the way he does. But, like, they show him halfway through the episode, and when they ask him, you know, like, oh, how did, oh, like, how did you survive? And he just says, you know, cryo. He doesn't explain why he had himself frozen or what he's doing there or why he's a part of Fowl. Like, it's just, you know, oh, he's rich. He can afford to, you know, freeze himself. Okay, so what, what's your purpose? What are you going to do now that you're, you know, back all youthful again? You going to say anything? <laughs> it's just, we have no idea what the hell Rocker Duck's purpose is throughout the, all this. And even now, like, even in future episodes, he never elaborates what it is, like, his whole goal is with Fowl. Well, you see, we've got to have money. <laughs> That's That that appears to be it. I, I don't get Rocker Duck. The other Fowl members, I get. I don't get Rocker Duck. Um, that, that's pretty much all I have to say. Anyone else have anything to add? I love, uh, Scrooge and Goldie throughout all this, like, being love-struck teenagers and stuff, and how, like, she seemed to genuinely want to change for him, and it's a shame that they didn't get that chance. Hmm. And, and also, I do like that she did change. She saved, she, she did two heroic acts and saved them, and, and basically... Uh, gave up youth. I, I I think there's some good stuff with Goldie, but that's that's about it. Um, okay, now for the episode I've been waiting to talk about. Oh my God! I just have one thing to say. Let's get uh, dangerous. I am the terror 
that flaps in the night. I am the soggy cereal of sin. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> <laughs> I love this episode so much. Um, well, it's a two-parter, but th this two-parter is perhaps, aside from one other episode that we're going to talk about, I think this is the best two-parter of the series and possibly the best two episodes, although it does have a contender. Um, this is an episode where I don't even know where to begin. Uh, we, we finally get follow-up with with St. Kennard and what's happening with the the new Darkwing Duck. We see where he's getting his gadgets. We're introduced to Goslin. We have an origin story. It has pathos. It has sympathy and empathy. And I cried because it showcased how good this Darkwing Duck was. Even though he's bumbling and doesn't always want to do the right thing, he does it for this person that he cares about. And you see him staying up days trying to help this person get their family back and it is so good but also as a fan of Darkwing Duck seeing these villains brought back and and the the actual like plan and how they made it work and this is just so good uh cat cat you're go on go on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I was gushing too. Like I love this so much because I I've been waiting for this. Like once once it was established that you know Darkwing would be a more solid presence in this show, I knew it was only a matter of time before they set up a spinoff for him. And this was just fantastic. It drew from the original source material. It drew from the comics. It drew from the original Ducktales. Like it had like so much going for it and it, and it's not just the main plot with Darkwing you know the side plot with the family too was pretty interesting it actually tied into the main plot and with Fowl like I d was not expecting that I thought this would be a standalone but nope they managed to interwove everything like real nicely and the new talent they got the for voicing all the characters like the way they rewrote everything the way that they set up for the spinoff like it was brilliant. I cannot praise this episode enough. Like, this is my favorite of the season. Like, most definitely. I just... Oh, man. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> oh, it's so good. And there's two things that I do want to address and then hand it over to the others. But uh, the first thing that I do want to address is I love how we finally get the, the outing of... Bradford, Bradford Buzzard in this episode and throughout the episode like he's trying to hide it while still being turned on by Bulba and it's tied in so damn well until he gets until Black Heron comes in and uses a foul helicopter. Very subtle. <laughs> Very subtle. <laughs> um, Eric, what do you think of this? I love how like this is really like a turning point not for two things. It's a turning point in the main story in the main story with DuckTales in that for Scrooge for Scrooge and the gang, this is their they finally see the the uh, the curtain has been lifted on Fowl and that they finally identify Fowl as like their main th as their main threat as far as trying to find all the other items that they've been trying to collect all season. It's also a start it's also the start of it's also the unofficial pilot for the Darkwing Duck series, which has now been confirmed that dis, that they're working on it for Disney Plus. So not so, and the way it combines both of them together, that it can be seen as one and can be seen as one or the other is just amazing. Like it doesn't, it's it's very cohesive. It like it doesn't like one doesn't overstay the other, and it's just very well balanced and I'm just, and I, and they managed to pull this off in like a four in a what 44 minute episode. It's just amazing how they're able to, how they're able to pull this off. And I'm excited for the duck, for the dark wing duck spinoff. Like I want to, I'm, I'm waiting for it to happen. So, uh, it's just so good. And there's, there's little things like I love the bonkers reference. I that... love the floppy dogs reference. Oh, that, that I, I'm, I'm watching it. I'm like, because, <laughs> I remember when we were doing the reaction, they uh, 
I was making a joke. I was making a joke saying like, oh, maybe they'll throw bonkers in there too, since they're throwing in Darkwing Duck and Goof Troop. Maybe they'll throw bonkers in there as a Disney afternoon thing. And then he randomly shows up. I'm just like, I was just kidding. I didn't, know. <laughs> I didn't think they were going to throw him in there. I told and I you. I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't expecting Fluffy Dogs. Who remembers Fluffy Dogs? Well, Rowdy, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> like, I can't believe they God. threw... I can't believe they threw in reference to two of, like, Darkwing's throwaway villains, like the Bugmaster and Jambalaya Jake. I'm like, oh my God. We're <laughs> 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 referencing the freaking hillbilly now. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong, it was funny, it's all hell, it's just I can't believe they did that. <laughs> and one thing that I do want to bring up also, because this ties into to Bradford as well, I love Black Heron in this episode, and I think this episode, and some of the recurring episodes afterwards, actually, like, made me like Black Heron much more as a villainess. And I finally understood her deal. Because I always used to think of her as a spy and nothing really more. But now that I see her and I'm like, she's she's basically the, the Bond villain. She's the <laughs> evil mastermind. She has these big plots and she doesn't care about subtlety. Like, come on. Who, subtlety, what's who, that? We're foul. <laughs> we're evil. Evil. <laughs> oh, you expect us to fly around a helicopter without a logo on it? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. I, um, I will say, though, yeah, that like, this whole situation could have been avoided had Bradford not shown up there. Because <laughs> think about it. The only reason they found out was because the, the triplets overheard him talking to himself. And, of course, you know, he had to get Heron to get to, you know, organize his escape plan, which he did with the most in the most obvious way possible. Like, had he not shown up, they still could have kept their secret. Like, he had really no reason to be there. He was just there to, like, yell at Bulba, and that was it. And it's like, you yeah, couldn't he, have done that over the phone? <laughs> yeah, he probably could have done that over the phone. Although it was a really great reveal, because I didn't see it coming. And, like, seeing him come up is like, yeah, but we're supposed to do this subtly, and this is more chaos. <laughs> and in seeing Bradford just unleash his his like inner rage against the the, the triplets very cool <laughs> was it um i love the the fearsome four when they showed up i'm like yes 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 <laughs> all we're missing is nega duck and then everything's complete <laughs> surprised he didn't show up in this but i guess they didn't want to distract too much from the everything else yeah, I think they might be saving Negaduck for other things, and I'm curious uh, about what they're going to do with Negaduck, if they're going to keep this Negaduck to the DuckTales universe, because at the end, the, the Darkwing villains go back to their own universe, and the Ramrod, which is either a Super Troopers reference, or just really <laughs> awkward naming, um, is destroyed, so I don't know, uh, Doug, thoughts? I mean, yeah, basically to piggyback off uh, of Eric from earlier, it's like, yeah, th this show just the they they could have so easily just kind of put, you know, the DuckTales main plot to the side, made this such a filler episode just to focus on Darkwing, um, you know, and yet they the love and care just the complexity of balancing both of these storylines of having both you know advancing the story to the next plot and having this backdoor pilot for Darkwing Duck and you have you know multi-dimensional stuff and you advance Owlson's uh, storyline which who the hell would have thought she'd show up again but thank god they they made her mayor I'm like, she so deserved it. But mm -hmm. it's like, I, I am just in awe. I, I freaking love this episode. Um, who knows, maybe, you know, there's something more to the Solego circuit if they're, you know, bringing it up. Uh, so 
there could be potential for you know traveling the multiverse again if they find a way um you know a, a more stable way than the ramrod um i also appreciate them bringing in the original villains from the universe in which you know the show you know from the the 90s is real and not only that but having like michael bell and whoever else come back to to voice these characters i i am just i cannot praise this one enough there's also the fact that they bring in even more references like two past DuckTales where they have the universe with the quack pack. <laughs> and, and... <laughs> I, I forget what the the recurring phrase one, uh, this, the, what is it, the sea monster ate me ice cream or something like that? Like the sea monster yes. ate my waffles! <laughs> <laughs> no, ate my ice cream. <laughs> I watched that episode again and I'm like, how did I forget this? It was, it was like batshit insane, those two minutes where he just repeats that over and over. <laughs> There's actually a clip on YouTube of just that from the original series of, you know, sea monster ate all my ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> With all that being said, let's get dangerous is a fantastic episode. Um, I, you know, I've been gushing about it. We've been gushing about it. I don't think I can say too, too much more without sounding like a broken record. Probably the best two part of the season, maybe the best singular episodes of the season. Um, but we'll get to my favorite in a little bit. For now, let's go to Escape from the Impossibin, which follows up on the events from the previous episode with them getting ready to fight off foul um everyone's paranoid scrooge beefs up his defenses and he wants the family to figure out ways to get through them and since you know uh he thinks his defenses are impregnable uh he's he's all laughing it up and then in the b plot we have mrs beakley trying to quote unquote train the boys with Webby in order to get them ready for any surprise attacks. Um, I love this episode. It's not it's not quite as good as Let's Get Dangerous, but that's really hard to top. But it, it does some really good character stuff. Uh, I love the A-plot simply because it showcases all the in like crazy traps and stuff that surround the money bin. And I'm wondering... If you have this, how are the beagles a threat? Because they have a time loop room. They have a time loop room. They have a time loop room. <laughs> I think Zen might be broken. <laughs> have you tried resetting it Zen? Might. <laughs> have you tried turning Zen on and off? <laughs> they have a room with giant tentacles. They have a room that has like reverse gravity for specific things. They have a room with saw blades that are invisible. It's pretty crazy. And then they have a Scrooge robot. Now, they get through it because they are the McDucks and they do this for a living, but I'm, I'm sitting there thinking like, most of their regular villains would not be able to get through this. Well, I think the thing is that most of his villains believe it or not, either are not interested in his men or are highly incompetent. So he's never mm -hmm. had to go to this degree to protect the bin before, whereas Fowl, who are, you know, shadow agents, this this could be easy pickings for them if the security isn't just right. I'm just trying to imagine Glomgul trying to make his way through this. <laughs> The only reason he made it into Scrooge's bin that one time is because he had to stop time. Literally stop time. <laughs> That's the only reason he was able to get in there. But can you imagine him at any other point being able to do that of his own volition? Don't tell me what to do. All I do is win, 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 no matter what. <laughs> I got money on my mind. <laughs> put, put your hands up. And they stay there. And they stay there. <laughs> And now we're going to get copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get copyright strike because of that. <laughs> oh, God. I really love the A-plot, especially because when they finally get through all these crazy traps, which were devised by Quack 
quack faster, and Gyro, the most devious minds that they could think of, which are their best friends <laughs> in, in their employ. Um, <laughs> um, once they get through all these traps and defeat the Scrooge robot, which he paid all, all this money for, Fowl is the one who ha has hacked into everything from the beginning and uses the robot against them. I think this twist was actually really good because initially I thought, oh, Scrooge forgot the, the combination or something like that. And, you know, Scrooge is clever, but he's not infallible. So I believe that. But foul hacking the robot, genius, especially because foul knows everything. And it really shows how, how dangerous and devious Bradford is because he was the right-hand man. And he took advantage, and he knows everything. It's it's brilliant. Doug? Yeah, I mean, basically kind of what you were saying before. Um, it, it, it's not necessarily the strongest episode, but because it follows right on the heels of Let's Get Dangerous and dealing with the, you know, the fallout from, uh, you know, the revelation of Bradford being in foul. It is very important. Um I absolutely, I definitely love the, that they split the group into two, and it's like you have uh, Della and uh, Louie figuring out the angles in, uh, you know, Scrooge's uh, bin, and then you have uh, Dewey and Huey being trained by uh, Beakley and Webby, and then freaking Webby going to task is... One of the scariest yet most hilarious things, especially <laughs> when uh, she pretends to be Dewey. I freaking oh my love God. that. <laughs> she is a master of disguise. What the <laughs> and and then when uh, what you call it when when Huey gets broken when they reveal the uh, the other bin and he's like we know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely enough, I had a uh, uh, I had a YouTube commenter like uh, talk about Webby or at least ask something about her because uh, I was a Climber thirty twenty one has an unpopular opinions uh, wondering if Webby is starting to come across as a kind of Mary Sue character I guess because she keeps getting all these new abilities and seems overpowered compared to the boys and other even other characters. I have to say I disagree on that just because she has her faults. She has her weaknesses. She's still a kid. Although I do love how it seems every episode she gains like a new insane skill that she manages to like perfect in no time. <laughs> well, I think a lot of it is because she's been perfecting this a lot of her life. I mean, Mrs. Beakley is a super spy. She trained her in everything. And yeah, there are some, some things like her, mas her mastery of disguise is eerie because there's one episode that we'll get to later where she blends in as a chimney and then you see her and I'm like, whoa, okay, this is creepy level good. And and her her dewy, her deception is pretty crazy, <laughs> especially the way she's able to talk like Dewey. Um, I don't think she's a Mary Sue simply because... Uh, she gets so obsessed with things, and that is a lot of her, her issue, where she gets so into it and so so blown away by new people and that she idolizes, and that's one of her big faults that holds her back. If I may piggyback um, off of that for a second, um, yeah. yeah, again, um, yeah, she's, you know, trained by Beakley and, you know, learns all these skills, but it is it does seem to come at the expense of her, um, you know, social abilities, which is why, you know, she is who she is at the very beginning. Um, you know, we see even, you know, going into, you know, a couple episodes from now, New Gods on the Block, it's like she's still trying to figure out, you know, social interaction. She thinks, you know, she could just easily... Uh, have the power to make people get along when in reality that's not how it works at all so it's like yeah she may be physically powerful but it does come at the expense of her you know knowledge of social interaction mm -hmm. yeah i i think that's a, a really great point yeah. uh eric do you have anything to add about this episode 
I feel like Mrs. Beakley went a little too far with the training. Like, she was, like, really push, like really pushing the boys and Webby. And even so much, like, like, re like near the end of it, like, pushing, like, Webby, like, so far. Like, so far, it's like, my God. It's like, my God, like, what are you doing? Like, this is, this is a bit much. And even like Webby was saying like, like enough is enough. And eventually, you know, eventually, eventually they come, eventually she comes around, but I'm just like, gee, I'm like, Jesus, like she, I, I know she's been training them, but like never like this hard before, but like, not like this. Exactly. Not like this. But like, but at least they were able to take, but at least at the end, they were able to take a step back and then rejoin, and then rejoin and, also, this whole training was a distraction mm. because then Fowl came in and took all the treasures that they've they've accumulated over the course of the season, and now they're now it's a race, which I said, which I think I said from like the beginning of the series of the season, like it's going to be a race between Fowl and Clan McDuck to try and get all the treasures for something. <laughs> Yeah, I was surprised that they I managed just... to do all that real quick, but, you know, kudos on them. Although, I'm surprised they took the Salego circuits, too. I have a feeling that's going to be, like, a major thing. Like, that's probably going to tie into, like, the whole thing with this, with Fowl's plot. Mm -hmm. mm. I do think this episode has some minor problems. I definitely think Beakley went too far, but they're leaning towards this being a plot point with maybe Beakley having a, a, an issue in the past. I mean... There is something that's connected in the first adventure that we'll get into. Um, but overall, despite some minor issues, I like this episode. I think it was funny for the B-plot, and the A-plot was very suspenseful, and did a great job of showing just how devious Fowl is. How cunning, how dangerous. We had seen them a little bit earlier in the episode, uh, not episode, earlier in the season, being devious but not to this extent and uh just now that we actually see their plans in motion th this is a force to be contended with um anything else you guys want to add i did want to mention uh two things one i love della calling out uh gyro <laughs> 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 that that was freaking hilarious <laughs> like, tell us how you really Long feel overdue. <laughs> you spend uh, 10 years on the moon with uh, licorice flavored gum, you start thinking of insults. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. And then the uh, the go-go action cane, which uh, is a direct reference to the, uh, the DuckTales game. So, more Easter eggs. <laughs> yeah, that was really great, especially because it kind of felt... Like, the entire episode from Scrooge's point of view felt like a level from a video game. And if they mm -hmm. wanted to make a sequel, they could do it. Oh, by the way, did Scrooge ever give uh, Louie and uh, Della that lunch? <laughs> <laughs> he probably wormed his way out of it. <laughs> well, you see, it, it, does, it does not count because he's family. And family is the greatest scheme of all. <laughs> yeah, Wait so a minute, sense. you're really Flint Hard Glomgold! <laughs> uh, speaking of Flint Hard Glomgold, you should not accept checks from this man. Curse because you, now... <laughs> Curse you, Zenith! <laughs> because now we're going to be talking about the split sword of Swanstantine. I like that this episode was actually a three-parter. Not well, not a three-part episode, but it's split into three parts. Much like the sword. One, much like the sword, and each one um, has different things for different characters. This is very much a character-building episode, and they each have to learn something about themselves to earn the sword. And uh, it's all a race to get it and put together, and the ending is really great. Um, but there's also a twist to that twist. Um, but let's take this bit by bit. First part is uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Dewey and Webby fighting against Gander D. And then there's uh, Louie and Violet with Rocker Duck. 
in Huey and Lena versus Steelbeak. Very interesting pair-ups, to be sure, uh, while Scrooge is busy taking care of Black Heron. Now, personally, I think that Dewey and Webby's part was the weaker one because, well, Gandra D is an interesting villain. I'm not really big into her. And the whole point is that they get flash bombed and Dewey uses confidence and luck to scale the building and get the sword. <laughs> uh, Kat, you want to take that? <laughs> Yeah, I made a big deal about this when we first watched it because it just was insane to me that Dewey was able to scale that building while blind with, like, minimal effort. And I get he's, like, really confident he just does stuff without thinking and that's, like, his strength, but, like, it was baffling me. However, um, YouTube commenter Kayla Bray pointed out that Dewey may have inherited some of Gladstone's good luck. And that's what helped him through that, which I'm actually inclined to believe. <laughs> so, yeah, I can totally believe that maybe, like, some inherited good luck came through with that. Because when you think about it, like, Dewey probably would have died several times over by now on all the adventures had it not been for his incredibly good luck. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I mean. Well, I think there's also something to be said that, you know, especially because it's with Webby, you know, the. The, the way that uh, Dewey and Webby's minds are very different, like, Dewey's kind of this pure instinct, and, you know, just kind of, you know, headstrong, whereas Webby's very, you know, calculating, logical, so it's, it's, it's definitely on Webby to, you know, learn from Dewey in this case that, you know, sometimes you can't always, you know, just be logical, sometimes you just have to go do it you know trust your instinct you have to do it <laughs> sometimes yeah. you just gotta do it exactly <laughs> you just and sometimes you pet a snake sometimes you just gotta gauze for it uh, that's such a bad line <laughs> <laughs> um i understood what they were going for with this with you know the luck with his strength is confidence and luck and i get that but it's a little bit one of the weaker parts of the episode because overall, I really didn't get behind uh, this aspect of it. It just, it felt a little bit far-fetched and I know we're in a cartoon about talking ducks, but out of the three, this was the least convincing to me. Um, my personal favorite was Louie and Violet because oh yeah, essentially... <laughs> They go out, go down to the seedy underbelly where they have to have a spice contest against Rocker Duck, and the first thing that they do is they use their reputa their reputations to get in and try to get the sword, but uh, you know they have to have the spice off. First of all, Violet <laughs> takes all the spices at once, which is friggin' badass. Violet is a maniac, and I love her. But then mouth of steel. They... <laughs> yeah, really. Mouth of steel. But they end up winning because of their actual reputations. They win not by lying, but because the stuff that they actually did is pretty damn badass. Yeah, really. I love this. <laughs> uh, you want to take this? I... Take this one, Doug. Yes, I absolutely love this one. Uh, I love how, you know, it, it comes down to the truth is actually scarier than the lies that Louis tells. Uh, I love freaking Violet in this one and just how, you know, nonplussed she is. And she she has freaking nerves of steel. She's badass. I freaking love Violet. You can take on Val by herself. <laughs> When mm -hmm. she was screaming into the uh, bucket uh, of water. <laughs> <laughs> also, my mouth is like, on fire. She ah! holds she, I, fire. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's also in, 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 you know cool to see that you know Louis just has this confidence about him that he could even walk into this you know situation, and you know he, he's got the charisma to 
you know, ooze his way in. But it's like, ultimately, that's only part of the battle. And I feel like it, it one, one thing that is great about this whole episode is just the, you know, the bonds between each of the two characters in each of the stories. And this one was definitely, th this surprised me and just for the best, best possible way. Um, I, I mean, Rocker Duck, again, he just feels like, why is he even there? He doesn't even have um, a bodyguard with him anymore. It's like, why do they care about him aside from the fact that he has money? But I mean, to be I mean, fair, I he had it's, an it's all... To be fair, he had an advantage in that situation by the fact that you know his taste buds no longer worked. So had it not been for Violet, just you know yoloing this thing, he probably would have won that. So. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean that. But yeah, that he still sucks. Was... I agree with that. <laughs> that bit was mm -hmm. funny. I really did like that. He's like, oh, but I can't taste my sweet, sweet food that I like, and you know, deviled eggs. Deviled eggs are good, um, <laughs> but uh, and what about what they do to cheetahs? Uh, Wait, do you mean the animal or cheaters? Yes, both. I love that <laughs> joke so much. That was, <laughs> you know what they say: cheetahs never prosper. Yup, 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 yup. And then we have the third part, which is Huey and Lena. And well, I think my favorite is Louie and Violet. Huey and Lena, I think, is the best because th the thing is, they have to fight against Steelbeak. And this is the worst opponent for, for Huey because Huey is a... He's an intelligent person. He... he All that he is is calm, neat, ordered intelligence. He doesn't fight against this dumb brute. Now... I do feel that Lena could have done something magical against Steelbeak, but this ultimately was about Huey. And so they bring Huey into the mindscape and, you know, find all the ways that he could possibly fight against Steelbeak, many of which are really stupid and funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your bravey brother! <laughs> <laughs> I what love sword? you. What sword? <laughs> it's all also, I, I have. Love you. <laughs> I'm you as a boy. <laughs> I just looked at all those and I'm like, you really expected some of those to work? Are you serious? <laughs> you wouldn't had a you wouldn't hit a guy with glasses, would you? Duh. <laughs> would you like a nice, delicious bucket of bolts? You're feeding him. You're, you're making him stronger. <laughs> um, so we have all that hilarity. And then it ends up with the the twist of this part of the episode is that while Huey is calm and ordered and all of this stuff, buried deep down, there is the Duke of making a mess, which is all the buried <laughs> feelings that get in the way of him being intelligent and rational and in order to save the day he has to work together with the duke of making a mess to become the zen master of chaos and order and i love it so professor hulk professor hulk really <laughs> yeah really um i i only have one issue with this part and i feel like lena probably could have taken Steelbeak, as she has magical powers but i, I love the whole point of Duke of making a mess too much to really have it be a problem. Uh, what do you think, Kat? I mean, I agree. Lena probably could have taken him. On the other hand, she still is, you know, learning to harness her magic. I know she made a lot of progress in the Phantom and the Sorceress, but I mean, she did only have like a few seconds to like work her magic. Plus given how, you know, Huey was insisting upon doing this, you know, the roundabout way i think this was more of a, a lesson like a learning thing for him because yeah he, he really needed that and lena was really yeah. the person who like best suited to like show him because she wasn't gonna you know pull any punches she was gonna be blunt with him and be like look you can't come at this from any other angle or use any sort of trick you gotta face it head on so you know that that's exactly sense. what he had to learn to do so and 
I, and I mean, it's important because some people need to learn that too. Like, for instance, I for I for one like related with Huey with this because I myself have anger issues, and it is very hard sometimes to separate, you know, ration from emotion, and it you know muddles things up. It causes you to behave in ways that you know make you resent resent yourself. So, you know, learning to you know showing that you know you can you know learn to use use both and find that balance i think was really important and again it sh highlighted huey's strength you know that he is emotion but he you know he can he can use his emotion to his advantage and then we really... the donald within <laughs> <laughs> i really did like the message of there are parts of yourself that you may not like and that may be um unseemly or, or something that you don't want to show the world. But they're part of you, and you can't ignore that. You have to make peace with that, and I think that was great. Uh, Eric, do you want to expand upon this? Yeah, I really... The Huey and Lena is, prob is also my favorite because it is something that I personally relate to, where I try to be very... I try to be very logical, but there's also the other side of me that's, you know, very, that can be impulsive and just, you know, have, you know, full of emotion and trying to find, you know, being able to not try to suppress it, but, all, but try to manage it in a way that can be sometimes beneficial, like trying to, achieve, you know, achieving that perfect zen and that, and that, and I always get choked up when Huey, uh, reconciles with with both sides because that's something that i something that i try to do and that's something that i can really it's something that i can relate to on a personal level i relate to this episode because there are parts of me and parts of my past that i would rather forget but the thing that i always take away from them is that the past is there to make you learn and grow from your mistakes, to make you become a better person. And I know that I am a better person than I was before. And as long as you're acknowledging that these things are bad and moving forward and acknowledging that this is part of yourself and working to be better, I think that's important. Um, this episode hit home on a very real level. I don't want to delve too, too deep into this. I already kind of did a lot during my Scott Pilgrim versus the World review, so I don't want to dwell too, too much upon this, but this episode really hit home, especially with that final, final portion message. Um, but there's still a little bit left. Um, well, before we do that, I do also want to, uh say my piece on uh this this portion Go right ahead. um yeah i also very much relate it's like i the more you know i've i've watched this and the more i think about it it's like as much as i absolutely love the uh the louis and violet i very much relate to uh to huey and what he's going through um grow i mean we've already kind of discussed back uh previously how you know there's the potential that Huey has, uh, you know, might be on the autistic uh, spectrum. And then there's also the fact that, you know, because I was uh, diagnosed Asperger's as a kid. Uh, also, I've had uh, ADHD. Um, and as a kid, I used to be just off the wall hyper and I'd get in trouble all the time. And I've kind of spent a lot of you know, time growing up and trying to repress that hyperactivity. Um, but I also know that I can't also be, you know, that calm, you know, logical person. Maybe, uh, you know, it'll kind of get annoying to people. But I have, you know, I also kind of try to avoid drinking. Well, I mean, I do avoid drinking. But I, part of the reason why is because I know that if I do drink, I fear that, you know, that part of me is going to come out and people won't like that. So it's it's very hard to, you know, try to balance that aspect. And I, I really give kudos to, uh, you know, to the team for 
giving this, you know, it giving such. How do I? I'm not even sure what to show. say about it. Just expanding on this with with Huey and you know making him such a fleshed out character. We really needed this, and it, it definitely uh, speaks for this season being his arc. Uh, I just want to say, Doug, we love you. You're a wonderful person, and and Eric, we love you. We love you, Cat. <laughs> Love you too. You're you're, you're good people. We love you. Love you. Love for everybody. And everybody gets hugs. Love. <laughs> I think it can speak to a lot of people, and honestly, the arc for Huey is really really good. It's very strong. Um, there's not too too much more to say about the episode. The final twist is that the sword only works for somebody who has um, inner strength, and they all have inner strength while the villains don't, and that's a really good twist. Um, but the final, final twist after that is that they weren't really after the sword, but Scrooge's feather. Mm. We don't know why. Uh, Kat, do you have any theories? <laughs> I mean, we've discussed this before, and I've been, like, going over all, like, the uh, treasures they, they've, like, you know, taken so far and everything, as well as those they've tried to take in the future episodes from here. And I know we've discussed the theory of clones, so, you know, possibly get a uh, clone of Scrooge in order to, you know, access maybe other treasures, like access his bins, or, you know, access a certain treasure that we're going to talk about in a in a future episode. But, I mean, nothing too solid as of yet. I know it definitely has some... It either has something to do with Scrooge himself or possibly his family line. Like, there's so many possibilities, but, I mean... I, I'm more inclined to think of, of cloning, but we'll, we'll have to see. Because, like, like I said, like, when I saw that, I'm like, huh. So, so, we're, so we're going into, like, real, like, deep down, deep down, like, infiltration here. So I'm, in, I'm interested to see what, where they go with this. Yeah, um, there there's some interesting ideas, but uh, a lot of it, we're going to have to wait and see. Um, does anyone else have anything to add before we move on to the final four episodes? Can we just talk for a minute about how uh, Scrooge and Black Heron were basically fighting throughout the entire episode <laughs> and even stopped for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, you can't fight tiring. on an empty stomach, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, God. And I don't know I... that she's like, she can keep up for that long, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I also did notice, I remember them mentioning uh, something about doors uh, opening, which when uh, we get to the whole, you know, Duke of making a mess, I, I caught that immediately when you see, uh, you know, the Duke of making a mess's door appear. Hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm going to <laughs> yep. uh, try to power through some of these last four episodes a little bit quicker because we're almost at an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Um. Two of these episodes, I don't have much to say about. Two, I two of them, I do have a lot to say about. So, I'm I'm gonna s try to balance it a little bit. Um, the next episode, New Gods on the Black, I don't have as much to say because it's just a really hilarious episode. <laughs> it's basically Zeus loses his powers because everyone agrees unanimously that he a dick because he's a dick. <laughs> yes, and that is universal hilarity. truth. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> and comedy ensues, and then the B plot is Storkiles trying to get Donald and Daisy to have a good date, and failing and almost breaking them up, only for the Titan to bring them back together again. Um, all the honestly, shipping. Uh, <laughs> all the shipping. Um, I don't honestly have much to say about this one. It's funny. Storkiles is always funny. Zeus is really funny. Um, I do want to comment on the kids' powers, though. Friendship is indeed magic in this episode, but it's also evil. <laughs> we have misguided. To misguided. Misguided. <laughs> misguided. Yeah. We have the Lord of the Dance, 
<laughs> we have King Midas, <laughs> and we have the Brain. God, that was the worst power. I can ever. never know that much again. <laughs> I mean, I do like that they uh, each, like, try to play to their strengths, but then it just goes horribly wrong. Because, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, kudos to them for trying, but come on. We all knew how this would end. <laughs> As with any Greek tragedy. <laughs> and that's the thing, like, I like that they have plays on these powers. Although, the dance got me the most. Like, wait a second. I was supposed to use my powers. Oh god, no. Can I, do I get a do-over? <laughs> you mean a do-over? <laughs> <laughs> and I like that when he actually uses the powers, he doesn't actually use the powers except for flying. <laughs> like th that was funny. I don't even think he used the powers for flying. I think he just saved himself naturally. <laughs> Cuz he's that he's that nimble. <laughs> Oh god! Like th this, this was a good episode. I mean, I liked it, yeah, just because again, it was Greek mythology, which I love, and there was just a lot of like you know hilariousness as a result of the powers and stuff. I also liked the shipping from like you know Donald and Daisy and stuff, and friggin' Storkiles, man, he God, he's so stupid. Mm -hmm. But I love how he how much he gushed over the two, and I like and... the and I like the battle at the end too. Like that was pretty cool. <laughs> God I ship store. God damn it, Donald! Clean up your trash. <laughs> I ship Storkules with Della and Donald. They a poly ship. They are <laughs> they are the best trio. <laughs> I could see it. What was it? I had a, someone point in the comments like where was asking, and they made a good point here. Are we sure Della and the Moon Goddess were besties? I'm really doubting that now, mm -hmm. to be quite honest, because given all the shit that Celine's pulled and, you know, how she keeps putting Della's family in danger, I'm inclined to believe they're not as close as, as you know, we're led to believe. Cause... Della was on the moon for ten years. <laughs> Celine is the goddess of the moon, and she never knew. Come on. Bullshit. <laughs> He's got a also... point there, though. <laughs> also, like, the moment that she's back, they don't actually visit Celine. And then the first time we see Celine and her together, they barely talk. I mean, they are, they do seem friendly more than any of the others. They do seem friendly. But Celine is very standoffish. And I don't know. Like, there seems to be something there. Like, I, Celine just sucks. It's very. I'm a, it, I it's, stand by that. <laughs> It's very different from how we saw her in in season one, where she was like gushing about, "Oh, Della was the best." Like, eh, I, it doesn't gel. It, it I smell retcons. <laughs> I I don't know. I, I do I, at least want to. I just think that the, the writers didn't, like... I think this is just a big loophole in terms of the writers. Like, they probably didn't take all that into account when they decided to add gods into this universe on top of aliens and every other stuff that technically should clash within this universe. Mm, aliens and magic and... <laughs> I mean, I do at least want to um, say one thing, that... Uh, this is good character development for Della because you see her genuinely being a mom to uh, to the triplets and Webby. <laughs> yeah, finally. Mm. <laughs> do you, do you have anything? Like... Hmm? Uh, go on. No, uh, I, 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 I made my thought. Um, I was just also. Gonna... Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Also, Hades. Hades is awesome. <laughs> I love Hades. <laughs> I love his lair looks like it's off a meatloaf album. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to say, do you have anything else to add, Eric? Um, fall, going off of what Kat was saying about Della being a mom, like, absolutely in this episode, because the whole setup for the entire thing was that... Was that... The kids were on a mission with Scrooge. Let's, for, let's not forget that this whole thing started because Scrooge uh, and the kids, they failed in a mission. And they've never failed on a mission before. And 
Scrooge was almost made it sound like like he didn't need the kids anymore to get the to go on missions and the kids felt bad about it so that's why they had to do this so with Della convincing telling Scrooge like you know it's like like Scrooge was like oh I didn't ever wanted to replace them but Della's like well then you should have told you should tell them that like don't you know don't just brush off on it and say like you know like like it's no big deal to you because it's a big deal to them and Mm. that's what I and yeah, that's that's probably the most mom thing that Della has done so far in this series. Yeah, the whole episode Della was being a really good mom. And also, I love how Scrooge takes like losing <laughs> like they they showcase the cycle like first is denial, sadness, anger and then back out there. Like I, apparently this has happened before. <laughs> Yeah, I, I imagine Scrooge has failed more times than he cares to admit. So it's good to know that at least his family knows what to expect, so they don't dwell on the, uh, you know, on anything, and they just move forward. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, now we get to one of the last big episodes. Uh, yeah, yeah, one of the last big episodes, the first adventure, which shows it's it's entirely a flashback, where we showcase how Fowl got started, and then the first adventure of Scrooge McDuck with Della and Donald as uh, they go out and have to find the Papyrus of Binding. I really do love this episode. It's very different for the series, but I love how it showcases how Scrooge has grown and evolved over the years. Like, he's always had adventures... But this is the first time where he started really enjoying them and and stopped really seeing them as a business venture and more of something fun. And the kids, as sidekicks, while they were in danger some of the time, they brought him out of his shell. And it shows why he kept taking them on adventures over the years. And also how Bradford was kind of crazy from the very beginning. Yeah, I, I was surprised to find that he was part of Shush. I mean, I guess I shouldn't, because, you know, it seems logical that that Fowl would have spawned out of Shush. But to see that, like, he had these intentions from, like, you know, from that early on, it, it just, I, I get I get what he intended to do. He's looking at it from a business aspect, but, you know, the fact that he was going about it as, like, a supervillain would, yet denying it, that that's what really threw me about him. Because, like, I knew that he was, like, you know, supposed to be our big baddie, but the fact that he's in denial about being a big baddie, like, that is really, like, the whole big thing now with Bradford. And I think that's going to end ultimately end up being his downfall once we get to the finale. Mm. I also really like that Ludwig called him out on this from the very beginning. He's like, I kept you on as a favor to your granddaddy, but you got to stop all this crazy taking over the world nonsense i can't do ludwig von drake accent i'm sorry um but it's it's really cool but then it starts him on this path where he sees black heron taken into custody freeze her and they start foul as her idea um it's it's well she created the f he he (laughs) wanted to start she owl. puts the foul in foul. <laughs> puts the F in foul. Mm-hmm. And this pairing is what really, like, I started liking Black Heron in this season uh, earlier on, but this is what made me, like, just love her because he's just like, we can bring world order, and she's like, we can bring chaos and evil. We're not evil. Yes, we are. <laughs> and it's like, fine, we'll be foul. I love her unabashed villainy. And that's that's finally what these episodes brought to me is like she is a super villain, super villain. She's she's maniacal. She loves just being evil. She's Cruella DeVille basically. <laughs> and she pairs well with Bradford. That juxtaposition is what does it for me. And uh I think this this pairing of them is wonderful. Would you agree with that, Doug? 
Um, I think she's more of the bad influence friend to uh, Bradford than really a uh, compliment to him. But, you know, if, if what you see is what you see, then, hey, I'll go with it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't really have too much to say on this episode. I think I said everything uh, in our live reaction. Um I do definitely want to mention, you know, um, getting the uh, young Donald and uh, Della back and the, the new voice actress for uh, young Donald since uh, Rissy Taylor passed away. Um, honestly, though, I, I don't have a whole lot to say on this episode aside from, yeah, I very much agree with Kat that, you know, th this is proving uh, that... Obviously, Bradford's really going to have to take a real hard look in the mirror and, you know, realize that he really is a supervillain. And I think it is ultimately going to lead to his downfall. And he'll have to realize that, you know, I really we really are the bad guy. And yeah, <laughs> he's going to have to face that. <laughs> Honestly, Black Heron and uh, Bradford, they kind of remind me of uh, Lex Luthor and the Joker when they work together. Because, like, in, in all in all aspects, they really shouldn't. And in the show, th when they cross over, they don't. But you kind of can't help but love it because, you know, Lex is all smooth and intelligent and has control and stuff. Whereas the Joker just goes ape shit and does whatever the fuck he wants and somehow everything works out. That's what it reminds me with those two. And I think that's how... You know, they've managed to, like, stay around as long as they have. Although I feel like maybe Bradford has reined in Heron a little bit over the years, since we don't really see her being as outlandish in the future episodes. But at the, sa at the same time, I feel like maybe Bradford has given in a little more to the evil influence, given what we've seen of him since, uh, you know, Let's Get Dangerous. But yeah, I am interested to see, like, what happens when he goes full on villain? Because you know it's going to be a shit show, a total shit show. Mm -hmm. Um, I also just want to say that I love the past stuff with Scrooge and the and the the two kids. Like Donald singing all these anti corporate songs are so <laughs> funny. <laughs> like Rich meet God. old Scrooge. Meet old <laughs> Uncle, my Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I love uh, how Della's the one who's just like, let's do it. Like, you know, we're going to go on an adventure. Yeah, woo. And and Donald's just like, yeah, corporate sellout. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, nothing it's, it's can kill me. I'm immortal. That I love. <laughs> and the adventure ends with them finding the papyrus, which is another treasure that I don't want because it's. It's basically Wacko's wish all over again. If you're too literal, it, you're gonna get you're gonna get something bad. It's the monkey's paw. Where I want the world, but where would I put it? <laughs> Here, it spins. Bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish I wish for, for fame and fortune. <laughs> <laughs> I wish for all the dough in the world. <laughs> <laughs> like. There's some really good stuff with this and the fact that they use the papyrus to erase the memory of Bradford is very well done. Um, the question is, where is the papyrus going to go now? When is it going to resurface? Who is the heir? Lots of questions. Um, but, uh, that's stuff we're probably going to get into in a little, little bit, but, uh, I love the stuff with Scrooge. I like that he's, you know, finally going on an adventure with people. He actually starts to get into it, especially fighting a skeleton robot pirate. Or parrot pirate, I should say. Um, not zombie robot. Pirate. I don't know where he got robot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a resurrected zombie skeleton pirate. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's, it's a really fun episode. Uh, before we get into anything else, I do want to say... In your reaction video, you mentioned that you didn't really get a sense of when things were in the timeline. After the fact, do we have a confirmed, like, when uh, the original, like, uh, Black Heron episode took place? And then uh, they mentioned Foul versus the 1960s episode? 
Um, I'm on Wikipedia right now under uh, the DuckTales thing, and it is saying, you know, in the 1960s, uh, Shush rejects Bradford's proposal, uh, and then they say uh, 30 years later, so in the 90s. So uh, I think what the confusion was, um, I forgot that there were multiple parties shown in that last Christmas episode. Um, so yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's clear that uh, this takes place before, uh, in, in the, you know, shush part, it takes place before the events of uh, Confidential Case Files of uh, Agent 22. Oh, um, okay, okay. Well, yeah. obviously, since and they then, called uh, Beakley, uh, you know, Agent 22, so mm -hmm. it was like that party we saw took place while shush was still in action but af mm -hmm. i believe after uh, bradford was hired by scrooge mm -hmm. I, I believe and then yeah so yeah the the 30 year jump uh i believe we're taking place you know after that party but before uh dewey's um part in the uh you know last christmas where he uh, meets della and donald so I yeah, will, I, I I will say that it was not as clear as it could have been, but yeah, that's out there now. Also, we get mention of Hortense, uh, Donald. Excuse me, uh, Scrooge's uh, one of Scrooge's sisters, who is the parent of uh, Della and Donald. <laughs> yeah, that that is true, and uh, I know you had mentioned that. Well. We, since we have Hortense, like what's what's gonna happen? Is is Hortense old or we haven't seen them? But it's pretty much confirmed that all of the Clan McDuck is immortal, given the next episode. But before we get into that, I do want to mention uh, one thing. I I really love the the ending scene with with Bradford, like Bradford just going in. And, and just, you know, completely having erased the memory uh, of his identity and just going in and, and sinisterly being the right hand of Scrooge. It's so well done. And you can see, like, the gears turning in his head. Like, you, you almost think that it didn't work because Scrooge was like, oh, I recognize you. Like, just such a great scene. Um mm -hmm. Anyone have anything to add before we move on to the final two episodes? Um, <laughs> just that Black Heron's great, and I want to be her as a villain one day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bradford's I mean, just a is... fun villain. <laughs> I, I will say, though, it is episodes like this that make me realize, you know, made, made uh, definitely hinted that the show was going to be ending because I remember this happening with like uh, Teen Titans where, you know, in the last season they have this whole arc very, very similar to what's going on with uh, Hush uh, or with uh, Foul. Um, but yeah, then they like stop somewhere in the middle to do a uh, origin episode and then you know we pick up with the rest so it's like uh, obviously this this is where i'm starting to really get the feeling that the the show was going to be ending <laughs> mm. it is a very good it's very good like way to end it on and if they don't pull the terra episode type thing then we'll be fine because mm, i love the final don't. season <laughs> I love the final season of Teen Titans, but not that episode. Mm -hmm. no, they won't um, do that. All right, they, let's briefly done... just... Sorry, real quick. Um, yeah, I know they definitely won't do that. The writers are too good to do something like that. Um, what was it? Uh, there, there is a comment, though, someone left on our video. It's actually a prediction they have in regards to the title of this episode. Um, uh, Claude Karingas predicts um, the series finale of DuckTales 2017 will be a three-parter, a.k.a. 66-minute special, and it'll be titled The Last Adventure. Mm. I think that actually sounds like a good idea and something that could possibly happen. I believe so, too. I think that would be perfect, you know, if the last episode was the last adventure. It would be a perfect cap-off to everything. I don't know about it being a three-parter, because was a Moonvasion was like a two-parter at most, I think. So, 
Well, both of the previous uh, season finales have been two-parters. Yeah, you know. so I don't know if they'd extend it to a three-parter necessarily. Maybe have, like, a build-up episode, but, you know, at the very least, a two-parter. Mm-hmm. I mean, definitely this season is supposed to have uh, more episodes than the other two, uh, but, uh, I mean, so it is always possible that it could be a three-parter, but, you know, we'll see. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, with that being said, let's briefly discuss the fight for Castle McDuck, which is a good episode, but it's a smaller episode. I don't think it's weak, but I think it is very... It, it's smaller compared to the other episodes. Uh, essentially, they go in to find the blessed backpipes of Clan McDuck, which Bless finally... Me oh! <laughs> finally explains Bless Me Backpipes, which makes me wonder, is there a cursed kilt... I wouldn't be surprised. Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, fight for Castle McDuck. They they have to find the Blessed Bagpipes, and essentially the Phantom Blot is trying to find it with his new partner, Pepper, which is probably my favorite part of the episode. All the while, we have Webby uh, finding out about Scrooge's sister, Matilda, and the Scrooge and Matilda fight over who gets a statue. It's a whole big family fight, and it escalates. And, you know, Whiskers, who is their pet hairball, <laughs> uh, gets thrown into the midst. And uh, all hell down broke loose. Don't talk about Whiskers that way. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskers was family. Uh, Eric, would you like to start us off with this episode? Uh so scottish i mean <laughs> <laughs> but well you know what they say if it ain't scottish it's, it's crap <laughs> i will say this though i like how i like how they brought back phantom blot and they gave him like a sidekick to work off of and pep and egghead pepper is such is so perfect together with phantom blot because phantom blot is like trying to be also but like pepper is like she's very enthusiastic and like wants to wants to do wants to be right you know go do right by him and like just the the chemistry between the two is just absolutely is just absolutely wonderful i just like plus it kind of ties into i think i think the three of us me doug and uh cat we were thinking that pepper there might be more to Pepper than we think. Like it might tie, like we're thinking like it might tie in with, with Webby and her parents and why Mrs. Beakley is watching, had to take care of Webby. Like we're thinking maybe Pepper is Webby's mother possibly or something from like some mission or whatever. But um, this whole, but the, this whole episode was just a, just a whole bunch. Was just a whole bunch of fun, and also the the side plot with Huey and Louie trying to find, uh, trying to find the treasure, that was a blast. <laughs> it is very much a let's have a bunch of fun. It is family feud. The episode everyone's fighting, but I mean they're Scottish, and and as I know from from Irish family, from Scottish family. We all fight. We all get into fights, and it's always the same thing. Even ancestors, long dead, we fight. But we still, we're still we still family. We all love each other. It's just, you know, some family's personal. And uh, that's, that's what I really like about this episode. It's funny, but it just goes to show that even the McDucks are not above fighting and, and have some weird, weird scruples especially when it comes to feeding whiskers food and and trying to flip the table <laughs> uh, nobody Kat, destroys what do you our family but us <laughs> 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 yeah the, the, i totally buy it like I, i've been saying since since like the first season that it is a disease with this family that you know they are always at each other's throats that they're so goddamn stubborn they're always throwing themselves into danger and this episode just proved that (laughs) but i mean it's important especially in regards to webby because 
you know, she wants so badly to be part of a family to have friends and everything, but she has to accept too that, you know, families fight and it doesn't have to be the end of the world if they do, as long as, you know, they're able to work through their problems and, you know, come to an understanding. Like that, I felt was, you know, the important thing in this episode, as, like aside from the whole thing basically being a big spectacle, of, you know, a whole bunch of Scots just yelling at each other. And uh, I definitely <laughs> love... I definitely love Matilda and how she kept, like, pushing Scrooge's buttons and, like, she acts so superior even though she has no right to be because she's basically, like, a lounge about who's, like, trying to start her own business but doesn't quite have the business mind for it. And also she's played by <laughs> Missy, and I love that. <laughs> Michelle Gomez, so, you're so a treasure. I love you. <laughs> so now we have the Doctor, we have Donna, and we have the Mistress all in one show. Uh, and they're time travelers. Space is warped and they're immortal. <laughs> they're they're all immortal. Like it's it's beautiful. I love it. <laughs> um Ah oh god, I, I I do like this episode. I love how it coalesces into this wonderful chaos. And and you know, they they work together and they use this emu to, to save the day. It's 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 wonderful chaos. It's not an um, emu, it's an investment. <laughs> <laughs> Get that filthy animal out of my hoose. <laughs> it's not an animal, it's an investment. It's family. Whiskers was family. <laughs> this is for Whiskers, he's had a hard day. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do to Whiskers? What did I do? <laughs> oh, that whiskers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and uh, I gotta oh. say, Phantom Blot and Pepper forever. <laughs> I'm shipping it. I don't Team, care. <laughs> Team Phantom Blot and Pe the, 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 Phantom Pepper Blot. <laughs> I, I have to say, those two are the embodiment of that meme from Parks and Recreations with like Chris Pratt and his girlfriend where she's like, someone will die and he's like, of oh, fun? <laughs> <laughs> that is very Also, true. both of them were on The Mandalorian. <laughs> John Carlo Esposito, and then we have... Why am I drawing a blank on her name? Amy Sedaris. <laughs> so we've got uh. Moff Gideon and, uh, and the... Um, the person from the hangar on Tatooine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have anything to add to this episode before we talk about the big, the big one? I mean, I do. Uh, I definitely want to talk about how uh, you know Webby, who's been like obsessed over you know Scrooge, over the Mac the Clan McDuck uh, lineage and everything, and it's like she finally realizes, you know. They're literally on a pedestal, and it's like it's something she cannot live up to, and that they can't live up to. Um, so it is nice to see her, you know, face that, and you know, that 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 was very sweet. <laughs> just and the whole chaos of all the statues coming to life and just insulting each other. <laughs> You couldn't... Uh, I had all of this treasure, and you couldn't afford a better burial? <laughs> <laughs> My son left me this castle. <laughs> you mooched it off your own, own son? <laughs> <laughs> he bites him. <laughs> oh, dirty uh, dingus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, I think this was the most quotable right. episode, if we're being honest here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it probably is the most quotable episode. <laughs> Alrighty, now we come to the big one. How Santa Stole Christmas. At last, we finally get an answer. <laughs> we finally know why why Santa Claus is not welcome at Mahoos. And it turns out... He knows what he did. Scrooge was the true Scrooge who stole Christmas. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Oh, wait. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's not I that honestly, surprising. It's not that surprising, but honestly, this is my favorite episode out of the season. And I think Let's Get Dangerous is better, but this really warmed my heart. 
it's oh. it's a very cliche kind of story with you know kind of how the Grinch stole Christmas, but when using Scrooge in this context where we've we've grown up and we've seen Scrooge, we know Scrooge, and we've seen all that he's gotten better about. Obviously, we just saw the first adventure where he was a little bit stingy but willing to help people. And then we see this, and it shows that, yeah, he's still not the best of persons, but because Santa believes in him, he becomes better. Um, there's so many layers to this episode uh, that I just love. And Santa Claus lies! <laughs> Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying his whole job is, is, you know, done in secrecy. So, you know, he has to lie to a degree. Plus, you know, <laughs> and then not, not to put a damper on this episode or Christmas in general, but Santa himself is technically a lie. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> plus, you know, we had to get this episode to happen somehow. Like, how the hell else was he going to get Scrooge to, like, do the deliveries with him? Yeah, um... I just like the idea of this episode. The entire reason why they stopped being friends was that Santa wanted to do things out of the goodness of his heart and to to promote goodness and warmth to people because that's something that people need at this time of year. And as someone who's dealt with a lot of hardships, especially in the previous year, sometimes kindness sometimes kindness can warm even the coldest of days and i think that's a message that this episode really pushes and seeing scrooge doesn't get it at first but seeing firsthand how kindness can help and change and it really warmed my heart. As, like every time Santa made his speech, I was just like, "Wow!" And this is an episode that you could probably pick apart a couple of things, but it just it hits me so close to home on, on every single level. Especially because I believe in the message that Santa in this episode says. It's not about getting something for your, for your gift. It, it, the whole meaning of Christmas is doing something kind for someone and not expecting anything in return. It's no grifts, no gimmicks. That's what Christmas is. And seeing Scrooge try to get people to buy coal from him on Christmas... There was an invoice in those damn packages. <laughs> it, you know, he didn't get it, but he he changed. And obviously not everyone in this world is capable of such change. We've seen such things in this world that some people just want money and nothing else. But I believe in the philosophy that we should spread kindness to other people. Cat, uh, I'm sorry for the heaviness. Uh, what what do you say? <laughs> no, I totally agree with you with all that. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I I've become rather jaded when it comes to Christmas over the years, but I do agree with everything you said of what it should be, what it represents, and how important that is to people, even above you know material goods and stuff. Like, I was kind of sympathizing with Scrooge for a good part of it, because, you know, at the time, coal was an essential thing for some people. You need to be able to warm your houses, and unfortunately, toys isn't exactly going to do that. But as we saw, that's not always the case. So, yeah, I just... <laughs> but dear God, Scrooge, like... <laughs> I get what he was trying to do, but the fact that he did that with everyone around the world just gave him a freaking lump of coal with an invoice in the year 2020. <laughs> just, <laughs> oh my god. Like, what was it? Uh, someone in the comments, was it, uh, yeah, uh, Clemmer 
3021 mentioned that uh, this whole episode feels like a commentary telling Americans that the coal industry is dead. <laughs> that, that's pretty much what it felt like to me, because it's like, what the fuck are they going to do with coal? Most people's houses are run by gas or electricity. You just gave them a useless clump of thing that's going to give them black lung or something. <laughs> just, Jesus also, Christ. I just have to say, that is four kids level evil. <laughs> Oh my god, is that fucking evil? <laughs> like, thank <laughs> god that they fixed it before people woke up on Christmas, because otherwise, I, I don't think I'd be able to look at Scrooge the same way again. <laughs> uh, um, Doug, do you have anything to add to that? So, yeah. Um, <laughs> first off, I want to say just how funny it was that uh, Burger Beagle, I think that's Burger, uh, no, that's, is the one Beagle that actually doesn't get bouncer excuse me uh that he's the only beagle that actually gets a gift and that everybody else gets you know coal or you know the bad coal um <laughs> but yeah um yeah definitely i i'm i'm kind of with you on you know the feelings of christmas and how it's like i'm more i i'm more of a like softy i am more of a sucker for christmas than i like to admit like a lot of time i will like blatantly yell at all the you know commercialism and everything but then like i see you know lights on a house and it's like on the coldest of nights it's just something about it just really it warms me it it, it just gives me that warm feeling and it's like yes i i, I can totally relate to how just you know a simple thing even if it's not you know practical can still you know warm you on the coldest of days on the coldest of nights and yeah it absolutely does nail that on the head especially because when when it comes right down to it there have been some days this year where i had to say to myself do I want to pay rent or do I want to do something fun today and not worry about what's going on? And some days you just have to go out and have a fun day, eat some good food. And yeah, it's not going to fix the problem, but you just got to do something fun. And that that's kind of the same thing. Eric, what are, what are your thoughts? I thought this was a nice little Christmas episode. I do find it funny how, like, Santa travels ba to the different towns based on alphabetical order, which is not really very organized. Like, because, like, you s say you start in, like, Albuquerque, and then you go to, like, then you go that you go through all the A's, which could be, like, all over the world. And, like, it's, it's, it's not very, it's, it's not really very very good from a logistical standpoint like you start you couldn't just start with one continent and then work your way over and it's like but no it's like i do it alphabetically that's why it takes freaking forever but aside from, <laughs> well, aside from that i do like the message of this episode in that you know sometimes we need like a little bit of we do need um a little bit of kindness you know a little something to warm ourselves not just physically but also in our hearts you know in days where it could be you know, in the coldest of days, like especially during the winter time. So I always liked that message and I kind of stuck that with me, you know, in the last holiday season and it made me see Christmas in a brand new light, really, with that message. And I thought that was really good. With that being it... said, I just want to leave off with one major thing. The moment that Scrooge gave Santa the disarming Thing for his house and let Santa back in his home that was I actually started to, to shed a tear because this entire show Santa has not been welcome at his house there's been lasers there's been traps there's been everything I'm pretty sure ninja died but now <laughs> Santa's welcome at his home and that that was big for me um do you have anything else to add? Um, I actually have three things to add real quick. Uh, in, All right. Uh, in regards to the whole uh, Santa going alphabetical around the world, um, in the comments, Klimmer3021 30, mentioned that uh, 
they think that Santa was testing Scrooge with the whole alphabetical order thing or as a way to get him more involved with the whole delivering presents thing, plus to prolong his time that he was spending with Scrooge. So, again, another one of Santa's lies just to get Scrooge, you know, to be friends with him again. Um, the other two uh, were kind of, I want to mention, are kind of mistakes on my part. Uh, when I was going over about the uh, treasures that were still left, I mentioned how they hadn't found the three-eyed diamond. That actually is not true. They actually, they, they haven't technically found it, but they have. Fowl actually is in possession of the third-eyed diamond. That's what they used in uh, the Double O Duck episode to make Launchpad smart. I just hadn't realized it at the time because I thought that was like a treasure they had to find, but oh no, Fowl already had it. So my bad on that. And the third one was actually something I kind of misunderstood from you, Doug, when you were talking about how Scrooge was, like, replicating the whole thing with Glomgold. Like, how when he first met Glomgold, and then rather than tip him what he was supposed to, he just tipped him with a dime, thinking it would have the same effect on him as he did when he was a kid. But that just led Glomgold to turning, like, full-on evil just to get back at Scrooge. Yeah, this is kind of the same thing. He gives people, you know, something outdated, thinking it's going to help them, but it's just going to get everybody pissed at him. That That's kind of the <laughs> same thing with the Glomgold episode. <laughs> mm -hmm. one, he doesn't learn. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I do want to say is that what really carries this episode, more so than Santa Claus himself, is that you really believe the camaraderie between Scrooge and Santa. It's never in question that they were ever friends. And at first, I was just like, wait a second. Scrooge invented Christmas? And it gets deeper and deeper as it goes. And, like, their friendship really, really warmed my heart. And the more it went on, the more I'm just like, they work really well together. And I can see where each of them is coming from. But Scrooge is still a colossal dick. <laughs> until the end so like i i think their friendship is is wonderful um does anyone have anything else before i sign us off because we've been going on for almost two hours so many holiday puns <laughs> the felice navi diamond <laughs> oh by gosh by golly <laughs> he's a father la la la, la la liar <laughs> jingle all the way <laughs> Well, I would like to end this with, like, the questions we have going forward in terms of the future episodes, because I believe we have 11 episodes left in this final batch before the show finally ends. So there are still a couple things that, of course, need answering that I would like to address. Like, we don't have to answer them in this, but I figure we should at least state them just to show that they're still a lingering plot point, if that's all right with you, Zen. That is perfectly all right. Take it away, Kat. Okay. Um, forgive me. There's quite a bunch here, but I'll try to power through them. Um, feel free to jump in with a few answers. Just don't linger on them. So here's my list of unanswered questions and ducktails and what will happen in the future remaining episodes. One, will we see Phantom Blot without his mask? Because I'm really curious as to what he looks like under there, because we've never, even in continuity, seen him without his mask. Two, could Phantom Blot possibly join the good guys in the future? I personally think he could, given the hints we've seen in the, his biosympathetic backstory. Um, three, will Magica show up again before the show ends, and will she face off against Phantom Blot one last time? And hopefully this time he gets his revenge. Uh, four, will the other villains team up to take down Glomgold? Because we know they ha all have a vendetta against him, given that he lost a lot of their fortunes, especially Magica. Uh, five, Will we ever find out about Launchpad's side adventures slash girlfriends? Because that has been... We need another cousin <laughs> to, to before that happens. Because <laughs> it happened it, it happened when uh, we, we, we were introduced to Gladstone. It happened when we were introduced to Feathery. So it has to be a cousin-centric episode for that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, six, what is Rocker Duck's ultimate goal? Again, I don't buy that it's just money. There's got to be something else. Otherwise, he's literally one of the worst villains in DuckTales to this point. Uh, seven, will Nega Duck show up again in DuckTales or be regulated to the Darkwing Duck series? I personally think he's going to show up in Darkwing Duck. I don't 
think he's going to show up again in DuckTales, but, you know, I've been surprised before, so I'm not counting my chickens quite yet. Um, eight, when will we get to see the Tailspin characters, and will Don Carnage make one last appearance? Because we know that the Tailspin characters are supposed to show up. We saw them in the posters, so it's all a matter of time. It has to happen in this last batch of uh, episodes. And, yeah, of course Don Carnage is going to show up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yep. The the real question is will they allow him to sing finally? They better. No. <laughs> but he can take his revenge on Dewey Duck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh number 9, will the rescue rangers return? I get that they're Please. under copyright, but they could make a cameo. <laughs> Please return. Thanks for the rescue. <laughs> uh 10. What happened in Mrs. Beakley's past to make her so overprotective of Webby? You know it's got to be something big, and it's got to be something foul-related. Like, the hints have just been proving that so far. Um, I suspect foul play. Boo! <laughs> Boo! <laughs> Shush! <laughs> <laughs> Boo! <laughs> anyway. Boo to the head. It's... Uh, 11. What is the significance of the missing mysteries, and what does Fallon need them all for? Because we know that they need all of the mysteries. We don't know why, and we don't know what happens when they come together. So that's the big question of what Fallon's plan is. Uh, 12. Did Isabella Finch know about the significance of the mysteries, and how did Fallon know about the mysteries in her book? Because I know Isabella Finch lived a while ago, probably before the events of Fowl and Shush, but something tells me she must have known something about it, which is why she was trying to find them, and maybe Fowl found out about it. Again, there's a lot to unpack here. I'm sure we'll get a back background episode explaining that. Uh, 13, will we see the Duke of Making a Mess again? I hope so. <laughs> I need to see Huey just going nuts. Zen wedgies for everybody. <laughs> 14. What does Fowl need with Scrooge's feather? Are they planning to clone him and possibly the rest of his family? I know we discussed that already, but I'm thinking that's a good possibility. Uh, 15. Will we see Daisy again? And what is, will, is her future with Donald? You know, I, I don't think they're going to get married. That would be nice. And, you know, finally. But... I hope that she shows up again because I, I like Daisy and I love their I love the couple. They're awesome. <laughs> uh, Sixteen. What happened between the first adventure and following Della's disappearance that made Mrs. Beakley step down as director of Shush and become Scrooge's maid? Again, tying into her whole backstory and all that. Um, Seventeen. Is Shush still around, or were they, or are they hiding like Fowl? Because we haven't really heard hmm. from Shush, aside from the background episodes. And, you know, again, seeing how Mrs. Beakley doesn't, you know, isn't a Shush agent anymore, I'm wondering what happened to them if they're, like, actually gone. Or if we had, like, a S.H.I.E.L.D. situation with, uh, you know, Hydra infiltration and all that. <laughs> they have been pretty silent, all things considered. Mm -hmm. Hush, hush, if you will. <laughs> shush, shush. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 18. Who will be the rightful heir to Scrooge that finds the papyrus? I believe it's going to be one of two things. It's going to be either all three of the boys or possibly Webby. Those are my best guess. Because you know it's got to be, you know, one of those four. Or if not all of them. Um, 19. If Donald and Della's parents are immortal, where are they? Because, you know, they eventually move with Scrooge, so... You know, and we would never see it from them. And Donald raised the triplets on his own. So, like, where's his parents been? Like, what the hell? <laughs> um, Ten. Is the magic that conceals the mansion gone permanently? Because Blot never returned the magic to the mansion. So, as far as we know, the mansion's there to stay. Um, mm. Castle McDuck, specifically, is what we mean. Yes. Sorry, yeah, no, I should have elaborated. Just want to make sure we're not getting that, you know, confused with uh, I know it's, I know it's technically mansion. a castle. Yeah. I keep thinking like it's a mansion. Yeah. yeah. Shit, what number was I on? <laughs> Is that 20? Uh, 20. Uh, will we get to see Hortense and Scrooge's other siblings? 
I mean, I think it might be possible, but I'm kind of doubtful about that. But I mean, I know he has other siblings, so who knows? I mean, we saw Matilda, so yeah. I mean, who knows? Know, we, Anything is possible. We know that they're immortal now, so yeah. So who knows? Um, mm -hmm. Twenty-two. Uh, what important role? Were, what important role will Pepper play? Is she possibly Webby's mom slash Mrs. Beakley's daughter? I'm thinking so, and I've heard, like, you know, theories going around saying that she either was, you know, brainwashed by Fowl, or maybe, you know, went against Mrs. Beakley to uh, their side at a spite or something. I don't know. It's possible, but I, that's what I'm kind of leaning towards. <laughs> Can I say how appropriate it is that that was question number 22? <laughs> <laughs> I also think that makes sense simply because her, her temperament is so very webby. Mm-hmm. And I see a magnet interacting, and I'm like, oh, crap, there's two of them. <laughs> <laughs> 23. How many, how many missing mysteries are left to find? Because we only know of the four on the first page. We don't know in total how many there are to find. I hope eventually mm. they give a solid number, but I guess well, that's left to be seen. Uh, the final question is, is Fowl going to recruit any of Scrooge's other villains? Because I know people have, like, you know, suggested like, oh, they're going to recruit Magica or Glomgold or Mark Beaks or whatever. I personally don't think so, given how inept some of them are and how power hungry and so on. But, you know, it's possible anything goes at this point. <laughs> you want to know what I think? I Jeez. think that all of Scrooge's villains are going to come together to thwart Fowl because they're getting in the way of their villainy. <laughs> Do you think for an instant that Bradford Buzzard would ever, ever recruit or ever work with Flinthard Glomgold? <laughs> he is Chaos Incarnate. Exactly. Why would he ever work, willingly work with him? <laughs> he did and... save the Earth. <laughs> Through his cockamamie and... scheme. By, through the most chaotic way possible. <laughs> Freaking sharks and parkas, or p sharkas. <laughs> I got a good shark guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Glomgold is going to save the day again. He is big in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> but don't accept his checks at all. <laughs> Also, don't let this man on a uh, kitty ride. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything else to add before I wrap us up? Um, just that the next episode to look forward to is called uh, Beaks in the Shell, and it premieres February 22nd. That's when things officially begin. So we got a good, uh, from the time of this recording, two weeks, two weeks before that happens. So I ready. I cracked and I read the synopsis, so I know what it's about. I'm not gonna say though for those of you who don't want to be spoiled, but I, this does answer a question that I left off of my list just because I know it's gonna get answered in this right away. So have fun, guys. <laughs> All right. With that being said, we've talked for a very long time, but the general gist is this season's really good so far. We're gonna have a lot to say next time too. Um, actually, there's less episodes in the next batch, so a little bit less, but probably more for the overall season anyway. With that being said, I am Zenith Warrior Princess, the cutest of buns. I'm Cat McBerry of Clan McGregor. I'm Doug McBerry, um, of, uh, it always will be! <laughs> I'm Y2 Staller of... Clan McStaller. Wait, no. Just, cl just Clan Staller. <laughs> and I am Scrooge of Clan McScrooge. <laughs> and uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a good one, everybody. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that bell for every notification. Have a good one, everybody. And uh, don't forget, just remember, Glomgold is the hero that we need and deserve. Just don't ride his glom coaster. <laughs>
Curse, Curse you, Flint! Fly, me, fly, me, wheel that! Curse you, me, Ferris, me! It's me! <laughs> Have a good one, everybody.